Okay, next let's talk about cytokines. Now there's quite a bit here, but we'll take them piece by piece. Generally speaking, cytokines are proteins that are produced by one cell that can have effects on the cell producing the cytokine and cells in the vicinity. Cytokines used to be known as lymphokines because this protein family was first discovered to have effects on lymphocytes. But eventually it was found that these proteins affect all types of cells and thus were renamed cytokines. In this slide you see a number of cytokines. There is the interleukin family, which is abbreviated IL. There's also cytokines which belong to the tumor necrosis family, of which tumor necrosis alpha is a member. And there are still other cytokines, which are termed the interferons. Here we mention interferon gamma, but we'll also talk about two others in the next slide. You can see on this slide that we've organized the cytokines by the cells which produce them. However, more high yield is the function that these cytokines have, which is summarized in this mnemonic here. You can use this mnemonic to remind yourself of the major function of the most important cytokines, but let's go through each one piece by piece and see if we can make sense of things. Now, of course, all these cytokines are involved in immunity, and broadly speaking, these are the molecules that allow immune cells to interact with each other to ensure an optimal immune response. But as you'll see, especially in the case of the interferons, cytokines also have effects on non-immune cells that generally make them more resistant to an ongoing infection. And again, we'll talk about this particular point in the next slide when we discuss the interferons. There are many ways that you can break down this list, but one way that I find particularly useful is by identifying those cytokines which aid in the adaptive rather than the innate immune response. In other words, I like to separate out those cytokines which are essential for T and B cell growth and activation. Now, as you'll see, while some of these cytokines have a major role in T and B cells, some of them also have effects on innate cells. But again, I'm going to point out the cytokines which are most well known for their effects on the adaptive immune system. So let's just pick them out first. The first is interleukin-2, or IL-2, and I'm just going to mark it with an A to stand for adaptive. The next is interleukin-4, and also interleukin-5. There's also interleukin-10, which as you'll see is a special kind of cytokine, and finally interleukin-12. One mnemonic that you can use to remember this is to realize that if you double 2, you get 4, and if you double 5, you get 10. And then you'll just have to remember that there's just one more interleukin-12. Now, most of these cytokines have been discussed in other parts of the immunology lecture, and you can go back and revisit those lectures. But we'll use this slide just to compare side by side each of the cytokines presented. Okay, so let's start with interleukin-2. Remember that in the activation of a T cell, that is, when both signal 1, antigen, and signal 2, costimulatory molecules, are presented by an APC, or antigen-presenting cell, to a naive T cell, that T cell will start producing IL-2. The most common example is in the activation of a CD4 T cell, also known as a helper T cell. So when this cell begins to produce and release IL-2, it actually works in an autocrine fashion and promotes the proliferation of the CD4 cell. So then you get actually many of these cells. And then if a CD8 T cell comes along, which recognizes its cognate antigen, it can be activated, again by antigen and co-stimulatory molecules, and then IL-2 will serve to promote its proliferation. And remember, what was signal 3 that we mentioned before? Well, signal 3 is cytokines. These are the cytokines that are needed for the proliferation of T cells. And interleukin 2 is an absolutely important one. Next, let's talk about IL-4. In certain infections, for example with helminthic worms, the body needs to produce CD4 T cells that are of the Th2 variety. Again, this was discussed before. And that's because these Th2 cells again, these are CD4 positive cells, actually promote the growth of B cells and help B cells to secrete their antibodies. That is, to change the antibody from a membrane-bound form, remember we call that IgM, to a form that can be secreted. And in this case, the B cells start producing IgE as well as IgG antibodies. These antibodies, in turn, can recognize and attach to the surface of these worms. 
IgE, of course, will also activate mast cells, which results in the degranulation of the mast cell and expulsion of the worm, for example, from the gastrointestinal tract. Interestingly, IL-4 encourages the formation of these Th2 T cells, but then it's also made by these Th2 T cells to promote the class switching from the membrane-bound IgM antibody to the secreted IgE and IgG forms. IL-5 is very similar to IL-4, and it is also produced in a Th2 response. As you can see, it promotes the growth and differentiation of B cells, but it results in class switching to the IgA isotype. Because IgA can be secreted into the gastrointestinal tract, it is probably the most important antibody against helminthic worms, which make that their home. The binding of IgA to worms is thought to neutralize or paralyze the worms so that they can be efficiently cleared from the GI. Interleukin-5 also plays a role in the growth and differentiation of eosinophils, which is a cell type that can produce toxic proteins against parasites. Unlike all the interleukins we've discussed so far, interleukin-10 is a quote-unquote inhibitory cytokine. It seems to inhibit a Th1 response and favor a Th2 response. It also appears and it's predominantly produced by a subset of T cells that are known as T regs or regulatory T cells. These are a relatively recently discovered set of T cells which produce IL-10 to inhibit inflammatory responses. IL-10 also seems to inhibit the function of macrophages. Finally, interleukin-12 is involved in the differentiation of T cells into a Th1 subtype. It also activates NK, or natural killer, cells. Okay, so now that we've talked about the cytokines, which have their most predominant role on cells of the adaptive immune system, let's talk about the remaining ones. First, I'll talk about IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, because these are cytokines which are produced very early on in an infection. Finally, we'll make brief mention of IL-3 and IL-8. Okay, so I'm going to clear out some space here and give us a little room to draw. Although you'll go over this in more detail in the pathology lectures, we'll make brief mention of it here. This, of course, is our macrophage. Now, when our macrophage recognizes pattern-associated molecular proteins, or PAMPs, on the surface of a pathogen, and again, this was discussed in earlier lectures, the macrophage will become activated it realizes that there's an infection going on. And remember, macrophages are very well suited to do this because they're found in tissues throughout the body and are the body's quote-unquote first responders. When macrophages are activated, they produce interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. And these cytokines have both local and systemic effects. The systemic effects are easy to remember, so let's talk about that first. When interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha are released into the blood, they actually have effects on the thermoregulatory centers of the brain and cause an increase in body temperature, which we know as a fever. Fever is thought to be an evolved mechanism which promotes the function of the immune system and decreases the virulence of pathogens. In addition, interleukin-6 induces the liver to begin producing acute phase proteins, or APPs. You can see it's written out up here, acute phase proteins. Some important acute phase proteins are serum amyloid protein, C-reactive protein, or CRP, fibrinogen, and the mannin binding lectin, or MBL, which we talked about earlier, which is part of the lectin pathway of the complement cascade. These proteins actually help macrophages better recognize and phagocytose invading pathogens, especially the mannin binding lectin and C-reactive protein. Thus, you can see this is a kind of positive feedback loop, where the macrophage is recognizing the pathogen, sending a signal which goes out to the liver, and the liver is responding by producing acute phase proteins that then enhance phagocytosis. In terms of their local effects, Interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha cause nearby blood vessels to become activated and leaky. By activated, I mean that the endothelial cells of these blood vessels produce molecules which are known as selectins, and I'll write that up here, which allow all sorts of white blood cells to bind the endothelium 
stop floating around in the blood, and enter into the tissue which has the infection. Again, this will be covered in more detail in the pathology lectures, so I won't say more about that. But let's just write that here in our table. So leaky vessels and activated endothelium. The local effect of interleukin-6 is less clear, so I won't write anything here. I'll just leave it as a question mark. Okay, so let's talk about interleukin-8, which is actually more commonly known now as CXCL8, which is actually a chemokine, which is just a cytokine which specifically mediates chemotaxis, or migration, of leukocytes. This bit here, the CXC, simply refers to a three amino acid motif that's found in the protein. Basically, it's two cysteine residues separated by a spacer amino acid, where the X can be anything. Like IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, CXCL8 is produced by macrophages after their activation. And whereas IL-1 and TNF-alpha allow leukocytes of the blood to become attached to the endothelium and then slip between the endothelial cells, CXCL8 tells those cells where to go. That is, leukocytes, but in particular neutrophils, which are the first cells to be recruited from the blood during an infection, will actually crawl toward the source of CXCL8. So in this discussion of interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and CXCL8, you can see how these particular cytokines are mainly involved in the early recruitment of neutrophils to sites of infection. In addition, they also produce fever and the production of the acute phase proteins as caused by interleukin-6 specifically. Whereas the other cytokines that we talked about, IL-2, IL-4, IL-5, IL-10, and IL-12, function much later in the immune response. They come into play to activate and promote a good adaptive immune response. Finally, there's interleukin-3. As you can imagine, in the course of an immune response, many immune cells are dying. Neutrophils are on kamikaze missions, essentially phagocytosing pathogens and releasing all sorts of free radicals, and ultimately dying. Macrophages are filling up with more and more pathogens. And so you can imagine that in order to sustain an immune response, you need to replenish immune cells. And that's exactly the role of interleukin-3. Interleukin-3 promotes the growth or proliferation and differentiation of bone marrow stem cells, which I've referred to before in lectures as hematopoietic stem cells. Interleukin-3 functions much like another cytokine you may have heard of, known as GMCSF, or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. In fact, interleukin-3 and GMCSF are structurally related, which may help you to tie things together and remember the role of interleukin-3. Notice, though, that interleukin-3 is produced by T-cells, and thus happens later in the course of infection.